So Kevin Murphy, uh, The Sun is a, a new show on AMC. It's based on a book. Tell us a little bit about adapting the book for episodic television. Uh, what was that process like for you guys? Well, the book is a sprawling epic affair. Uh, it goes from 1849 when Eli McCullough, the main character, is, uh, is, is a teenager, and it goes uh, all the way up until uh, 2012 uh, and, the, uh, and the death of his uh, great-granddaughter, uh, Jeannie McCullough. And it's essentially the history of oil in Texas, which is also the history of the modern industrialized United States. Uh, and it's told uh, through the eyes of one particular family. The uh, challenge that, uh, that, that, uh, that Philip had, and Philip did the original uh, adaptation for television, was deciding what pieces to use and what pieces to set aside. Uh, and for the purposes of, uh, of the series, the captivity narrative that is young Eli in 1849, uh, you know, being raised as a slave and captive to the Comanche, that hues pretty closely to the book. Uh, the 1915 storyline that involves Piers Brosnan, where Eli is now older and is transitioning from being a cattle rancher into becoming an oil man, uh, that was created largely out of whole cloth and it was and it's essentially a prequel to what happens in the book so it's so so basically it was a big job figuring out what what needed to stay and what and what needed to go right i forgot to mention the author of that book was philip meyer thank you for uh, yes bringing that up um how much did you I mean, you touched on this a bit but uh in terms of deviating from the book scenes that you may have created. How much of that did you guys do? Uh, we did, l let me preface by saying, uh, although we deviated quite a bit in many places, that was done with uh, Philip as an enthusiastic uh, participant. And what was really wonderful about working with Philip is that there were no uh, sacred cows. He, if something was a good idea and made for a better television show, he was, uh, he was all for it. Uh, I think one of the biggest uh, tectonic deviations that we made was we moved the character of Jean Ann McCullough, who's one of the three main characters of the book, up a generation. Uh, in, the, in the book, she's uh, Eli McCullough's great-granddaughter, and we moved her up to become Eli's granddaughter so that uh, the three generations of McCulloughs, which, which are uh, Piers Brosnan, uh, Sidney Lucas, and Henry Garrett, could all be in scenes together, which wouldn't have been possible uh, if we had stuck with, with what the book is. So of course, moving the character of Jeannie forward in time uh, unraveled a lot of uh, things things in the book. And that's something that we're gonna be dealing with as we age her character over the course of future seasons. We've been seeing this a lot lately, not just with this show, but uh, Handmaid's Tale is another great example of, of bringing books to television and, and adapting them into television series, it's not just many series. Um, series -y. Um, I wonder what the benefit of doing that, of adapting a book for episodic television as opposed to, say, a movie or a limited series. What's the benefit of that for, for someone like you? Well, I think the, the, the benefit of that is twofold. One is that uh, you reach so many people with a television series, even a television series that is, uh, you know, even like, you know, modestly sampled by viewers. Uh, you, you're, you're talking huge numbers. You're talking millions and millions of people who get to experience a work in a different way. And I think that that's, uh, that, that's really exciting in and of itself. I think also the medium of television allows you to explore the source material in a different way because you can show things. And I think you can use music and you can use visuals and you can create something that is uh, different from the source material, but is a, 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 you know, a viable work of art in and of itself. Uh, from my perspective, having source material in making a television show is really great because it's like having this fully stocked larder of really uh, delicious snacks that you can go in and, and pick something. And there's always a feeling uh, in the writer's room of, of, of sort of victory when we are able to find something that was really meaningful to us in Philip's book and we figure out a way to put it into the series. Uh, you, you, you kind of feel that you're, you're, you're 
you're, you're being true to the source, which is very important to us. And, and, and with that is also being true to the, uh, to the, you know, to the native content and being true to the Comanches, which is also very important to us. Speaking of which, I mean, you cover a lot of ground in this show, I think like 65, 66 years in total. Mm -hmm. So what kind of research did you do aside from the book? Um, photographs, journals, you know, anything other than firsthand accounts, obviously, um, that helped with your, your show. Well, we, we, we did a lot. Uh, first of all, Philip meticulously uh, researched the novel. Uh, he read, uh, you know, a couple hundred uh, books in preparation. And what was great about having uh, Philip involved is he was able to distill for us sort of like the top 20 most useful sources. Uh, we all became voracious consumers of historical nonfiction. Um, there, there was a book that we got on, uh, on uh, Black Vaqueros in the Old West that was really useful for getting insight into the character of, of Neptune. It was really useful in getting a sense of, of to, like what it was like to be a you know to, to be a black ranch hand at this at this period in history. Uh, there's several really good uh, books about the Comanches. There's captive narratives. Uh, we have a very close relationship with the Comanche Nation, and we have a uh, a small army of advisors who inspect every set piece, every TB, every weapon. Uh, they do our uh, our English to Comanche tra translations for us. Uh, and our department heads also uh, become uh, have become experts uh, in their field. Uh, Kate Adair, a costume designer, she made a pilgrimage to uh, Lawton, Oklahoma, where the Comanche Nation is based. And she uh, toured their archives. She was given access to their photos, to their art, to samples of actual uh, Comanche wardrobe, including things that were actually like used by Quanah Parker. Uh, and she brought all of that back. And whenever somebody does research, we put it onto a big Google site that's accessible to other actors, the writers and directors. Uh, so it's really important for us to try to keep it real and we do it as much as humanly possible. I actually just uh, spoke with your costume designer not too long ago and she was oh, talking a lot she's about wonderful. it. wonderful. Yes, she is, yes. Um, Aside from that, I mean, you as the as the showrunner of this show, mm -hmm. um, can you talk a bit about plotting out the season? Um, and, and I mean, we're we're in such an age of television where there is this uh, uh, serialized drama uh, in episodic television. So, how do you plot out the season for something like this? Well, the way we began is uh, all of the writers get into a room, and we have a general tent pole. And one of the things that was sort of agreed upon, you know, bat way back when the show was was a pilot stage was that there was going to be a not to give a spoiler, but there is a uh, a really pivotal plot event that in the book happens at the very beginning of the book. Uh, and the decision was made that we were going to build towards that pivotal event. And if you have read the book, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so knowing that that's where we had to end up, then there was then there were discussions about how do we get there and i think there was a lot of discussions about at what point does eli discover that there's oil on the garcia land and at one point that happened in the first episode and we ended up where that actually uh then becomes sort of a midpoint turn in, in the story uh as as we as we got together uh, we put index cards on the board and we try to kind of figure out what happens in what order where the characters are at each point it's it's a uh, and then as new ideas happen suddenly something that's at the end of the uh at the end of the season needs to happen earlier we then move the card and before too long patterns start to emerge from what we've put up there and then once we have something that we feel is uh is a viable structure in terms of the big picture then we start breaking it down into episodes and we create another big bunch of cards on the board that list all the episodes and columns and then we sort of figure out which happens in which episodes and slowly but surely you start to get uh, a structure for the season it's a lot of work um it is <laughs> <laughs> now you personally uh, wrote two of these episodes is that right it was second empire and, and marriage bond i mean uh, I you guys write we, we, we all yeah we, we we all write as a, we all write as a team 
It's like I, I deserve I, I don't deserve sole credit for anything with my name on it. And I'm involved with everything in, in the season, as is uh, Julia Ruckman, uh, as is Philip. Um, we once once we, um, you know, Dan Connolly, who's a supervising producer, the way it works is all of the individual writers do the first drafts of their episodes. Uh, we break them all as a group. We outline them as a group. And so the writer is then uh, goes off for a couple of weeks to kind of do their version of it and kind of add their own spin on it. And then uh, once production begins, we kind of downsize and it becomes myself, Julia and, and Philip who do all of the production rewrites and we deal with, uh, you know, what we, what we learn on the go as we're, as we're shooting and as we get to the final, the final versions of the scripts. Something I'm always curious about in regards to this, um, uh, within the writer's room and, and you're assigning these different episodes, I mean, were you looking for uh, strengths within individual writers or, you know what I mean? Um, what, what we look for, um, I, you know, when I'm hiring a writer, I look for creating a balanced staff. And it's great for me if there's one writer who specializes in lean, tough, muscular, masculine dialogue. If there's another writer who really thinks about, well, where are the women in all of this? And how do we work the women voices into this? If there's someone on the staff that's a history buff, if there's someone on the, if there's someone on the staff that uh, thinks in terms of macro structure and can think about how we're laying out uh, our eventual move into the future generations of the McCullough family, because the ideal version of the show is there's a lot of time jumping and we want that to feel coherent. So it's trying to find every, every member of the team has their own individual X-Men superpower that leads to the best possible superhero team. Right. Um, to that end, uh, you know, this, like I said before, this covers a lot of ground and it's a historical drama and um, working on a TV budget to, to crank this stuff out. What are some of the challenges of, of that? Well, working on a TV budget is you never can truly be as epic as the movie that plays in your head when you're imagining these episodes. And part of uh, running a show is reconciling a commitment to excellence with the art of the possible. And it's taking what you can do and figuring out how to take uh, the box that your budget puts you in and turn that limitation into an asset somehow. And if you can't actually show a big giant bloody gunfight, maybe you can find better scenes by exploring the tension of the characters on the eve of the gunfight as they sit in the tent or walking the battlefield you know, uh, you know, you know, after after the gunfight's taken place, and that's something uh, you see that a lot in Game of Thrones when they run up against uh, the limitations of their budget. There's a lot of people talking about what's about to happen and what's and what's just happened, and only like once a season do they really kind of get in deep and give you the battle. And for some, and sometimes those scenes that happen intimately between a couple of characters, those are sometimes my favorite scenes. Absolutely. And so, so that's that's one thing. The other thing is. The, chal the challenge is if you have a limited budget, the way that you can put the most on the screen is by being really, really organized and having scripts done ahead of time. And what we did going into season one that was a big help is we had uh, eight of our 10 scripts already written and we had two scripts outlined. So we were able to, as we were sort of designing what our town was gonna look like, we knew for example that uh, Niles Gilbert's bar was going to burn at the end of the season because we had already you know, written that outline. And therefore we knew to build the bar as a facade and the actual interior location of the bar that you see on the show is actually located somewhere else. And that allows us to make sure that every dollar goes on the screen where it belongs and that we don't waste money. And you can, and, and, and you can only do that by being ahead on scripts. So we're gonna try to do that again in season two and we'll see how that works out. Right. Um, speaking of those intimate moments, you guys have a really great cast in this show, uh, starting right at the top with yeah, Pierce Brosnan right up at the top there. Uh, talk about uh, bringing them together to work as an ensemble and, and getting the, to put them in the mindset of, of being in this you know, 1800s, early 20th century. I mean, how, how do you go about doing that? 
part of how we do it is we we, we allow them access to our uh, our research and to our uh, little wiki page that we create internally, and we allow uh, you know David Wilson Barnes was very interested in learning about uh, you know the, the 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 underground gay club scene in Austin and the red light district. It was, it was Guy Town was was the was was the, was, the, was the district, and he was interested in learning about how that would have been because that was helpful for him for his character. Uh, for uh, for for Zon McLaren and, and Elizabeth Francis and and and, and Jacob Laughlin, um, you know they did a lot of uh, you know research and have a lot of conversations with uh, with, with the Comanche lifestyle, and uh, they you know uh, Juanita uh, Pataponi, who is our sort of point person in the Comanche Nation, we had her on set whenever we were doing uh, big Comanche scenes, and she was there to kind of tell stories and vet what we were doing and make sure that we were you know keeping it real in terms of the, the way the way the way things actually were and she was always available to the actress as a resource which i think was was tremendously helpful and of course philip was also an amazing resource because he's he's an encyclopedia of uh of, of the old you know of, of the old west right. before we go i want to ask you you are an emmy winner uh, for your work on uh, Reefer Madness. For my musical <laughs> work, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> you were also nominated as one of the producers on Desperate Housewives. Yes. Um, I forget the year, but uh, can you talk a bit about what that kind of recognition meant for you? Uh, it was really great because having done like one show that's a big giant mega hit, it sort of opens the door to be able to do other things. And what was wonderful was after Housewives, I was able to uh, go and do Reaper, which was this very goofy, uh, you know, speculative fiction show uh, that was created by dear friends of mine. And I was able to consult while I was developing and just have a really great time doing a wonderful show that not a lot of people watched, but I think has, you know, ended up having a huge uh, cult following. Uh, it allowed me to go into, uh, you know, hard science fiction, which is a great love of mine. And I got to work with all the Battlestar Galactica people on Caprica, which was great. So I just think it's, it gives you opportunities to kind of stretch and do other things. Uh, because if you make a lot of money for people one time, you get to do other things, you know, but this show, this is my first uh, effort at doing, uh, you know, historical drama. And it's been really, you know, it's, 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 been, it's been a really great experience. I don't know that I would have gotten that experience uh, without having experience running, uh, you know, other, other things that came before. Kevin Murphy, thank you so much, and uh, congratulations on your work. Thank you so much. Bye. You're welcome. Have a good one.